Okay, everybody ready? Here we got an echo going. <clears throat> All right, welcome and good evening, and uh, welcome to the Federway uh, Special City Council meeting on uh, April 5 of 2022. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. It's great to have everybody here. All right, um, we are here uh, for a study session regarding the Federal Way Transit Center uh, light rail station surplus property. Uh, first, we'll have our introduction by um, uh, Ryan Medlin, our city liaison to Sound Transit. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council President. My name is Ryan Medlin, the city liaison to Sound Transit. I'm going to introduce to you um, Jordan Rash, who's the uh, project manager for the Sound Transit uh, transit-oriented development process here in Federal Way. Um, I did want to mention briefly that this process is separate from the approval process that all of the light rail extensions went through. So these, the projects he's talking about are for um, properties that were used for construction staging or other purposes and will be made available to developers to develop upon them what we don't know yet. Uh, so they will go through the standard land use process based on whatever's ultimately proposed to be on them. Uh, what the DA, what the development agreement for the Federal Way Link Extension does say is that it commits Sound Transit and the city to a partnership to look at these properties uh, from an angle of trying to achieve both the city's stated planning goals for the area as well as Sound Transit's equitable and TOD development process goals. Um, so with that, the Sound Transit portion of that process is what Jordan's here to go over with you today and answer any questions you may have as we uh, make that introduction. And before he gets up here, I'll just mention that there will be additional Sound Transit staff that are supposed to be here, but they're stuck, currently stuck in traffic. So uh, with that, I'll introduce Jordan Rash. And the irony is uh, inescapable. <laughs> it happens every time they come. That's right. All right. Great, thank you, Ryan, and members of the council, Mayor Farrell and President Kochmar. Uh, my name is Jordan Rash. I'm a senior project manager at Sound Transit for our TOD program. And I suppose it does happen every time we come when our folks are coming in from Seattle. I, however, came in from Tacoma, so you can't, can't lump me in, perhaps, with that. Um, you know, with, so with me this evening, I'll introduce them even though they're not here yet. Uh, but first, I have Nathan Gaylor, who's our construction manager for the Federal Link Extension Project. And eventually, we'll see Mara D'Angelo, TOD manager, Thatcher and Bowden, who's our director of, of the Office of Land Use Planning and Development, uh, Jamee Hoffman, manager for our light rail development. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, you're presenting that up there. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for that. I did not notice it. Thank you. Uh, Jamee Hoffman, who's our light rail develop uh, our manager for light rail development for the Federal Way Link Extension Project and Katie Drew, who's our uh, government and community relations officer. And so as Ryan has already introduced, but I'll, I'll restate, uh, we're here this evening to provide an introduction to the Sound Transit TOD program. Uh, and for some of you, this will be a reintroduction. This is a similar presentation to one that was made back in 2019. Do I have to click? There it goes. Great. Just took a couple tries. You'd think by now we'd have it, but here we are. All right, our presentation this evening will provide an overview of Sound Transit surplus property and transit oriented development program uh, and uh, process, excuse me, as well as to provide you with a status update on our efforts to explore potential TOD outcomes for the Federal Way Transit Center. And first, Sound Transit has been supporting transit oriented development on our surplus property for nearly 15 years. But what constitutes a surplus property? You know, so we uh, have construction of major infrastructure that often requires land for construction staging and for field offices, materials laid down for that construction and for, for testing. 
And once that work is complete, the agency may have excess property, meaning property that is no longer needed for construction, uh, nor needed to operate the transit services. And so in those uh, instances, the Sound Transit Board may declare these sites surplus and available for develop redevelopment and or for disposition. And what do we mean by transit-oriented development, or TOD? Well, TOD is meant to be well-connected and oriented to transit, and that it supports transit ridership and can create new centers of activity and accommodate growth with less demand on our roads. And with TOD, there's an interplay between the development serving as a catalyst and uh, needing supportive uses or similar projects nearby meaning that TOD can spark investment and development, but it can't exist on a metaphorical island. A TOD uh, tends to be an ur in urban in form and is ideally mixed use. It's a place where you can pick up uh, a gallon of milk or drop off your dry cleaning, or perhaps there's a, a childcare center, et cetera. Uh, and TOD reflects the local planning context, the, the zoning, the development code, as well as our comprehensive plan goals. And so far, Sound Transit and the city have been engaged around TOD opportunities uh, within the Federal Way Transit Center area, as well as what's already happening in your community uh, that will inform the TOD outcomes at that center. And while we're following what's going on outside of the Federal Way Transit Center surplus property, our focus is going to be on the agency TOD, meaning property that is already owned by Sound Transit not necessarily on property that is going to be uh, uh, in the vicinity of, meaning that's where our focus is going to be on the development of our property, the agency property. Uh, so agency surplus property can be redeveloped for a wide variety of uses, uh, such as office space, community buildings, parks, retail, housing, uh, all of which may be suitable to agency TOD sites, depending on market feasibility, jurisdictional needs, and requirements, as well as, of course, our community engagement uh, supporting that TOD process. And the starting point for these potential uses is a state statute that was adopted in 2009, or excuse me, to, uh, 2015. Referred to colloquially as the 80-80-80 uh, rule, RCW 81.112.350 requires sound transit to, quote, dispose or transfer any surplus property with a minimum of 80% of the surplus property to be disposed or transferred including air rights that is suitable for the development of housing or uh, development as housing must be offered for either transfer at no cost sale or long-term lease first to qualified entities that agree to develop affordable housing on the property consistent with the local land use and zoning laws and in addition uh, for those properties that are transferred leased or sold to qualified entities for affordable housing those entities must develop those properties to provide 80 percent of the units to serve 80% of the area median income or below. So those are the 380s. And so for Federal Way, what are we talking about which, with respect to the 80% of the AMI? Well, for the most recent census data that I was able to find, you know, 80% of the AMI is, is roughly $55,000 or the equivalent of a starting salary for a teacher in the city of Federal Way. Uh, it could be someone who's an assistant store manager at a box store. It could be someone who's perhaps like a, a store manager of a Starbucks. Um, so th that's kind of what you're looking at in terms of 80% of the AMI. In addition to the state statute, the Sound Transit Board of Directors adopted, adopted the equitable TOD policy, which identified the agency's TOD goals. And consistent with prior board action, as well as with the state statute that I just referenced, and as well as the voter-approved ST3 package, the policy provides a framework for assessing and evaluating equitable TOD outcomes, uh, early in system planning, and throughout all phases of transit project delivery. In addition, the policy acknowledges the importance of working with local jurisdictions on equitable TOD outcomes, and how those outcomes support uh, the overall vision and comprehensive plans of the local community. Applying the statute and equitable TOD policy to projects like the uh, Federal Way Transit Center helps Sound Transit and its jurisdictional partners to inform the TOD goals. These goals, in conjunction with the operating assumptions that each surplus property uh, that is suitable for the development of housing would provide an affordable housing outcome, or at large sites, like again the Federal Way Transit Center, uh, those would see a mixed income, mixed use approach. And to facilitate this, Sound Transit and its jurisdictional partners seek to minimize property costs to create affordable housing, which may include a discount in property value at the time of sale or transfer 
for qualified entities to develop that affordable housing, as well as to bring funding to bear to support these affordable housing outcomes. In terms of planning and implementing those TODs, Sound Transit and its jurisdictional partners work to develop stationary plans, such as those that Sound Transit and the city have created for the Federal Way Transit Center, explore TOD opportunities, and then seeking development partners who will uh, implement TOD projects that align with the vision and opportunities of that particular site. Sound Transit has several examples of successful implementation utilizing surplus property, and the very first one to note is appropriately uh, right here in Federal Way. It's called Senior Center, or senior, excuse me, Senior City. This project was the agency's very first uh, agency TOD project and was completed in 2009 by the Korean Women's Association with Common Ground. Uh, the project has 62 affordable housing units, and all of those units are affordable to the 60% of the AMI or below. Uh, and if, in addition to this being the very first TOD project on agency property, uh, it also represented a $17 million investment in your community. <clears throat> and our second example is uh, Capitol Hill TOD, which is located in Seattle. And this site is directly adjacent to Capitol Hill Station, providing link light rail service to UW, to other places in Seattle, and of course to SeaTac Airport. The developer constructed four buildings with 428 housing units as part of a mixed use, mixed income development. And of those units created on the site, approximately 41% of the 428 units are affordable. Uh, and in addition to that housing, the site also provides retail space, a public plaza, and is part of the AIDS Memorial Pathway, which is a community art memorial project. And our, another more recent example is one that is nearing completion known as Cedar Crossing, which is at the Roosevelt Link Light Rail Station in Seattle. And this project is scheduled to open this year with 254 housing units serving tenants earning 60% of the area median income or below. And in addition to the housing this project will create, the project will also include a multilingual daycare that is operated by El Centro de la Raza, as well as a ground floor retail. And Sound Transit was able to incentivize this project by offering the site below fair market value. The developers are qualified entities, meaning they're nonprofit affordable housing developers, who are eligible to receive agency surplus property below fair market value under that RCW 81.112. 0.350 for the development of affordable housing. And our final example to provide is the Spring District TOD project in Bellevue, which uh, is where Sound Transit worked with the city of Bellevue to configure the surplus property oriented to attract dense mixed income, mixed use development. And the site was offered through a joint RFP, which included the city of Bellevue as well, and attracted multiple dynamic project proposals. The winning proposal is, is what is depicted here, which is a multi-partner uh, project led by Bridge Housing, uh, which is a qualified entity that will deliver the affordable housing component of this project. But altogether, this project will deliver nearly 1 million square feet of TOD and is part of a six building project, two of those buildings being market rate housing, two of those buildings being uh, a uh, commercial building's office over retail, and two of those buildings being affordable housing. Uh, Bridge is seeking to utilize innovative private financing, some of which uh, supported by the Evergreen Impact Housing Fund, which is a uh, housing fund uh, that is invested in part by, by Microsoft, among other entities, uh, to complete the affordable housing component of this project. And finally, the developer is constructing the site infrastructure and will phase delivery of the project with the housing developed first. All told, this represents more than a half billion in investment in that particular community. And this site, which is similar in size and scale to the Federal Way Transit Center, is unique given its size and its breadth of TOD opportunities. It affords Sound Transit and the City of Bellevue uh, great flexibility, not only into what was offered, but also great flexibility to the development community in crafting their proposals. These proposals, again, were dynamic in their content and creative in their development concepts in part due to the partnership by, uh, between Sound Transit and the City of Bellevue uh, and the due diligence that was conducted prior to offering that site and that the community engagement conducted to ascertain the community's interests as well as in the potential uh, redevelopment outcomes. Ultimately, these projects are successful 
because Sound Transit works with the local jurisdiction, uh, as well as our community-based organizations, developers, and regional funding partners to bring resources and expertise to bear. We're now going to pivot to what TOD opportunities uh, the Federal Way Transit Center may provide, briefly cover the work that has been completed thus far, and uh, to explore the feasibility of the site's redevelopment, and discuss next steps to bring a project partner or partners on board to begin to implement on those opportunities. We already talked about Sound Transit's uh, TOD policies as well as the state statute that directs uh, the agency's disposition strategy. Uh, however, the redevelopment of the future surplus property at the Federal Way Transit Center will also be informed by the uh, existing agreements and policy documents from the city itself. You know, as some of those that, that Ryan had already mentioned, in particular, the Federal Way Link Extension Development Agreement between Sound Transit and the city, which outlines our coordination on the redevelopment of the surplus property. Uh, so it, it goes without saying that Section 8.14 of that agreement really does tell us, tell Sound Transit, and of course our partnership with the city, that we're looking for a dense, urban, mixed-use, mixed-income uh, development on that site, not just um, you know, one outcome or another. It's a mix of all these outcomes. And of course that those outcomes would be consistent with the city's uh, planning efforts as well as consistent with the uh, Sound Transit's equitable TOD policy. And with respect to the process, we're still very early in the evaluation of the site uh, for potential TOD outcomes. Uh, delayed by changes to the design as well as uh, to staff capacity, we have only conducted portions of the site feasibility uh, that you can see here in the top of this, this graph. Uh, though the bulk of that work, such as evaluating market conditions and compiling site constraints, as well as conducting community engagement, has not yet gotten underway. So we're still in this due diligence phase that you see here and intend to begin conducting the site feasibility uh, later this year. And if that is the case, approximately a year later, uh, we would be able to go to the Sound Transit Board with a disposition and offering strategy uh, to seek development partners for this property. And the TOD opportunities that have you know, certainly matured over the past couple of years and you know, as you know, the design of the Federal Way Transit Center depicted here was the product of several years of planning between Sound Transit, the city, and others. Uh, this design is what was provided to the design builder going back to 2019. Uh, and this design creates a framework that is conducive to a mixed use, mixed income, walkable urban center, all the things that you're finding in that development agreement that we've talked a little bit about. However, as the design progressed, it became clear that the pedestrian route between the garage and the uh, station could be improved. So, we ended up with something that is, is uh, well, is what you see here. Uh, uh, so thus, between the March of 2020 and around the end of last year, uh, the site layout was updated into this configuration. Uh, and the key differences are that the, the bus loop that you saw on the previous slide was moved uh, to be uh, located adjacent to the Link Light Rail Station, which opens up a future surplus property in the northwest corner, which is what you see there. Uh, in addition, uh, the bus layover was moved opposite of 23rd Avenue, creating future, another future surplus site uh, here. And in the previous iteration, you also saw that there was going to be a second garage located on that same parcel, and that is now adjacent to the existing garage, so further opening up that parcel. So this updated site plan fits, again, with the street grid that the city and Sound Transit have planned out, improves the pedestrian connectivity between the garage and the future TOD. Uh, and of course the station and creates additional TOD opportunities just by providing that additional space. All told, we believe there will be somewhere between five to six acres of total surplus property here with uh, sufficient space for four to five pad sites, four to five sites for buildings. In addition to the updated site layout, Sound Transit is con uh, contracted with an architectural firm to conduct a massing study for the Federway uh, transit Center surplus property, and this study was part of a portfolio-wide planning effort uh, by Sound Transit TOD, and the findings have been shared with city staff. And massing studies provide a modeled outcomes as well as provide a uh, virtual representation of building typologies that give us an, an idea of how a building may fit into the aesthetic of the community uh, and the station area itself. Massings are not designed schematics, uh, they're not ready for construction. This is simply a planning tool. So what you see here is not meant to be actually constructed. But it does uh, tell us a great deal about what the Federal Way Transit Center surplus property may offer. Namely, that the site can accommodate a large number of units. It is possible 
to, to build somewhere between 600 and 1,000 uh, units, depending on a variety of factors, a variety of choices, a variety of outcomes. Uh, which, of course, this would be supported by uh, commercial space as well as pedestrian and open space. And in addition to the massing study, we've also initiated a traffic study that will inform future developers' designs and potential traffic mitigation solutions. And we anticipate that particular uh, piece of due diligence to be completed sometime next month in May. And so over the next few months, we will take the information we've gathered to launch a TOD feasibility study. Uh, this study will tell us how much space is available for redevelopment, how the market conditions in the area inform the potential uh, development opportunities, as well as what opportunities may exist for affordable housing development, among other factors. This study will be supported by a community engagement process, which will help to inform our development and offering strategy for the surplus property as well as to inform Sound Transit, uh, the Sound Transit Board's decision-making in surplusing and offering the site for redevelopment. So that concludes our prepared remarks, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening to share this work with you. Uh, we've really appreciated the opportunity to not just be here, but of course to, to collaborate with your staff for the last several years, uh, and so we really look forward to seeing how this progresses over the next, well, several years yet. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Council President Coach Mark. Thank you. Uh, would you mind putting back up the Spring Hill uh, slide? Uh, yes, Spring District, absolutely. Spring District, TOD. Mm -hmm. So this is in Bellevue, and I believe you said that this was the most uh, uh, similar to Federal Way. In terms of its size, yes, ma'am. In terms of size. And so how high are some of the uh, how high is the affordable residential buildings? Oh, I'm getting a hand signals from the back. These are seven-story buildings. Seven-story. And w when, when you're talking about there's 501 total units, mm -hmm. but you're telling me that in Federal Way there's room for 600 to 1,000 units. Yeah, that's like if you went to the absolute max. Yeah. So there obviously we'd have to go higher than seven stories and more than two buildings. It also depends on how much amenity space you put in, commercial space. It, it's, again, it's a variety of factors. Uh, okay. To say that it would just absolutely be a 1,000 units, it, it'd be, you'd have to really <laughs> stack a lot of decisions in, in one direction to get that maximum number of units. So are each of these units uh, considered to only have one BFO? No, I don't believe so. I, I so actually don't remember what the parking ratio is for these off the top of my head. I'd be happy to follow up with you. Where do they park? Well, there would be podium parking. Podium parking. Yes, that means parking that's, uh, it's a raised structure that's on the bottom couple floors of that building, and then the housing goes above that. So, uh, thank you. And so, um, do, do these residential units have to be apartments? Can they be condos? Oh, they absolutely could be condos, okay. yes. We have not investigated that in terms of like, what would the market deliver, but there's, there's no uh, prohibition on, on them being co-op or condo units, any kind of affordable ownership so, or something like uh, that. Can the city require that a certain percentage be condominiums? I'm actually not sure. But if we discuss this with you with a developer and the market could allow it, would, that could be a possibility. As like a uh, condition uh, on the RFP Correct. or something? Correct. I, I believe so. I could follow up with you on that. I, I'd be, because that's one mm -hmm. of the things we'd like to look into is Mm -hmm. Condominiums Absolutely. for first-time home buyers, which obviously would be a starting <coughs> teacher, would be a manager for Starbucks. Okay, and then uh, I, I, a couple more questions on the residential, uh, excuse me, on the um, mixed-use office. Uh, how tall are those buildings? What's the height? Are those, again, less? I'm sorry, I was writing down your question, ma'am. Can you repeat that for me? Uh, oh, the, I'm sorry. The mixed-use office, are those also seven-story buildings or less than? Or? Oh, for the Spring District? Mm -hmm. Where's that? Oh, there it is. But how tall are those buildings? The office buildings. Okay. I'll, I'll repeat it because he's not yeah, in the mic. I heard him. Seven to eight stories. Yeah. So, uh, and that's fine. So, um, what we're also looking for is some kind of um, retail at the base that would be more than just retail, it mm -hmm. would also offer restaurants or, you know, some place where our millennials would want to gather. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's. Part of this mix or not oh in terms of this particular site mm -hmm. yeah there's there's ground floor retail within those no, uh, I mean two more offices of a, more of a um, craft brewery or someplace where our millennials would oh. like to oh okay okay for example if they're going to live and work mm -hmm. some place to for them to also recreate yeah yeah 
Do you want to come up, Thatcher? Uh, this is Thatcher and Bowden, uh, who's our director of the oh. Office of Land Use Planning and Development. Thank you. Um, so the, in the Spring District uh, 120th station, um, you know, right now we are currently working with our developers. We've approved, our board has approved the terms with the developers. They're currently um, planning and designing uh, those buildings. So they do not have uh, specific ground floor users in mind. Okay. Uh, in the station area, there is a new brewery. I think it's Bellevue Brewery that just opened kind of off screen kitty corner from here about a block from the station and so I think in general um, there's a lot of new office development and they are thinking about kind of what are those office <coughs> tenants and their employees wanting from a use perspective okay so I'll, I'll give up my uh, just I'm, I don't want it but there's a park in here also I see a little space for a park open space correct as a part of the development plan the developers decided that providing kind of some centralized open space mm -hmm. to meet the city's open space requirements uh, would be a, an appropriate way to, uh, where they could all pool their resources to build that park. And ultimately, it's gonna be a privately owned public space. Uh, they're gonna be working through with the city as to whether or not that is provided through an easement. Um, you know, the city of Bellevue uses a lot of uh, public easements to provide uh, open space. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank all right, thank you. <clears throat> First, Councilmember Walsh, then uh, Councilmember Stephen Dawson, uh, Deputy Mayor Hunda, and then Councilmember Doby. Councilmember Walsh. Yeah. Uh, once the the property, the, the surplus property, leaves the hands of Sound Transit, would all of it be once again mm -hmm. on the property tax rolls? I think it depends on who it goes to, right? I mean, if it goes to a nonprofit affordable housing developer, it's no longer on Sound Transit rolls. Again, that's assuming we sell it. We could also do ground leases. So which that would keep it on sound transit rolls. So it's, it's, it's too early to presuppose who would actually own that property once it's been surplused and once it's been uh, redeveloped. So that could be a, a realistic uh, uh, thing for the, the city to consider is how, whether or not it would be on, on property tax rolls again then. It, it would certainly and, be something. And, and, and would the city be able to have input on that, on what the, that outcome is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's something that we have to consider as well. You know, like, is this, is this something that we want to have a ground lease on? Is, if it's not, then you're talking about a fee simple sale. Um, and then uh, oftentimes with our affordable housing projects, we do have restricted co uh, covenants that go along with that property. So while Sound Transit may not own it, it is restricted to an affordable housing outcome for those particular properties that have that covenant. Okay. And with that, with this 80%, uh, would that, uh, over the years, would that 80% uh, um, you know, the, what is it, 80% of the AMI. Of AMI. AMI, would that be inflation adjusted over the years then? Yes. I should hand it to Thatcher. How does that, how does that adjust over time, Thatcher? Yes, so um, a couple things. One is, uh, to answer your question directly is, um, it's 80% of area median income at the time of, of the initial occupancy of those tenants. And so it does adjust over time. Um, and then secondly, just to clarify, I think on, on this particular property, because I think that while our statute uh, talks about 80% of the units being affordable at 80% of area median income, it didn't really consider the scale of the properties that we were starting with, right? So 80% of 1,000 units is a whole lot of units that realistically you couldn't build that much affordable housing on that site because there's not enough resources to build that much affordable housing. And then there's a policy question about how much affordable housing should you build on any individual site. So in this case, we offered you know all seven-ish acres of property to um, the affordable housing community to deliver on a mixed-use, mixed-income project. So the city, we had Sound Transit and the city had goals to achieve a mixture of uh, we wanted office space, they wanted housing, uh, and that we knew from a financial perspective, getting more than two buildings of affordable housing was not realistic. Um, and so what we ended up doing is we kind of tailored how we offered the property to get the overall vision of the site accounted for. So the way that the statute ended up applying is the two buildings in yellow, buildings three and six, which are gonna be developed as affordable housing, 80% of the units within those buildings will be required to have uh, affordable housing within them. The other ones are not being accepted by a qualified entity. They're being developed by market rate developers, and that those statute requirements won't apply to them. So we s that's kind of the long-winded answer. Of so it's not 
overall it's 80 percent of the specific it's 80 percent of the of, of a property that is transferred to a qualified entity for affordable housing 80 percent of those units need to be affordable we do have you know as a part of the statute uh, an obligation to make a good faith effort to implement the statute and I think that what we've tried to do is look at kind of what is a mix of goals that are trying to be achieved across kind of horizontally across the site and then what are the resources because even if we give property away at no cost you can't build affordable housing uh, without additional resources and so that's we're really taking a partnership approach working with local jurisdictions local affordable housing funders and trying to align all those decisions before we go out to market so that it's not a surprise what we're going to get at the end. All right. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Sefa Dawson. Actually, I think you just answered my question. It was around the 80% AMI and um, as, as it fluctuates or as it go, when you have new people moving in, they would be using the new AMI calculation, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my question. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Thanks for coming here tonight. Is the 80% required of the surplus property, um, is that system wide or is it per um, location? Per site? Yeah, we're, we're really looking at a portfolio. So 80% of our portfolio that is suitable for housing. Per site? For, for throughout our portfolio, not just through our site. So you could have some sound transit surplus property at, at some project that has no affordable housing? There are sites that do not have affordable housing, that's correct, when there are individual parcels. But as I said during my presentation, when we are looking at a particular property, our, our approach is to try to get an affordable housing outcome with a single parcel. When you have a larger site like the Federal Way Transit Center, our approach would be a mixed use, mixed income approach. So you would have some market, you would have some affordable. Yeah, sure, go ahead, you wanna add some so, color? So to, um, to give you an example, at the Angle Lake Station in SeaTac, Sound Transit has two properties there. As a part of our uh, decision making as an agency, after you know consultation with the, or engagement with the city, um, you know, we ultimately offered one of the two properties first to qualified entities to build affordable housing and the other uh, we offer to the broader market and so through that um, you know we're getting about 95 affordable housing units on one of the properties and then on the other property uh, about at least 230 um, market rate housing units in with about 20 percent of the units uh, being affordable through the market or sorry the multifamily tax exemption program that the city of SeaTac offers so that's one way where we we made a decision on two individual parcels, different decisions, but we contemplated it within kind of a framework of, of we have these two properties, how do we move them out uh, to the market? So in that case, it was 50%, but we, we take it from, a, as, as Jordan mentioned, a portfolio perspective. And so our compliance to date around the, the overall, we've offered about 94% uh, of our surplus property since the statute has gone into effect first to qualified entities. And we do have a few examples of where we've offered it first for affordable housing where we didn't have a developer uh, uh, respond to build affordable housing. So I think that's also something to be aware of. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's where Dovey. A uh, yeah, couple questions for you about the Spring uh, District, one, the, the one we have up here. Now, is this, <clears throat> this project in Bellevue, is this finalized and this is kind of what you're doing there? Is yes. it already baked? Uh, yes. So in this case, um, this project has a very long history in the sense that um, Sound Transit uh, in, the, in the city of Bellevue were looking at how could we try to maximize the amount of development near the station. The station is just off the screen to the bottom right. right. And we went through and we were building a, a, an operation and maintenance facility next to here. And so when we went through that process, uh, we entitled the development site for about 1.1 million square feet of development. A similar kind of uh, breakout of, of buildings. We had three office buildings and three housing buildings. But when we went to the market, we just had kind of certain baseline goals that we had that we developed with the city of Bellevue. Because ultimately, we aren't building it. You know, we need, some, we need right. development partners. So we offered that out to the market, and we got proposals back. 
We selected this one because it best met our, our goals. They are now going to have to go through the city's uh, permitting process. So while we entitled it, they are deciding to build two office buildings, not three. They decided that rather than amend the existing entitlements, they would just go and get new entitlements. They're in the beginning of that process. And so the city will, from a regulatory standpoint, still have some uh, role there. Some things they have to do. But from a, a general business strategy, this is something that Sound Transit gave their stamp to with the city. And it's buildable and it's acceptable to everyone on quotas of how many affordable housing and how many businesses and things like that. Is that correct? Correct. And we, we had offered this property with Bellevue as a joint partner because they were actually owned a little bit of this land. Mm -hmm. And then we also offered it with King County and Arch, uh, who brought some affordable housing funding to the table. And, and this piece of property is about the same size as what we're talking about in downtown Federal Way? Pretty comparable, yes. Pretty comparable. Yeah. So, so if the city of Federal Way said, hey, we really like that, we want to duplicate it, we're all in, let's do it just like that, would Sound Transit be open to that type of thing? So we don't have to go all around because you already got the cookie cutter done? I, I would say this is actually comparable to what we're looking for, meaning it's a mixed use, mixed income approach. <coughs> it's a dense urban walkable area. That, that is what we're looking at. It's a, that's verbatim as to what's in the development agreement. Yeah, so this would be not saying that there's seven people to do it or a staff that wants to, but this meets affordable housing, it meets market rate housing, it meets business development, it meets parks, and you've already got the cookie cutter done, so there wouldn't be a lot of cop. It could, could, could be copied if we decided to. I, I would say that, you know, in general, you know, with our property opportunities, they represent, I mean, they're right next to stations, and they are major community development opportunities. And so I think, you know, while we have lots of lessons to learn and experience from these projects that we certainly want to apply and bring that wisdom and lessons to these processes. We don't generally try to do cookie cutter in the sense of... Well, when I say cookie okay, cutter, I'm talking process and, yeah. and, and ratios and sizes, not, hey, we want to rubber stamp the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I think we recognize that this is a major opportunity within your your community to realize your vision and you know we want to make sure that we are engaging communities and engaging the city to make sure that we are you know leveraging this public property for public benefits and making sure that the decisions we make are going to um, realize the best results but also you know are based in you know having the, the a very transparent discussion about um, you know vision and pragmatism and trying to find the right balance between you know, what is it that you really need to have success and to pen potentially trying to understand are there certain constraints, whether that's infrastructure or market or the financial markets that might hold us back on realizing it. And sometimes that's okay to wait, right? <coughs> this is a, in this project, just to give you an example, the office, even though there's a huge office market in the Spring District right now, the developers are anxious about, you know, what what does the cycle look like? And so we have a 10-year they have a 10-year option to build office buildings. And so while we think that they might go quicker, um, that's something we had to discuss with the city, which is how long are you OK with waiting on individual parcels? Mm -hmm. um, that's, okay. that's the kind of discussion. Thank you. All right. Uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Um, well, I was just going to bring up the, the timing, because you may be aware, aware that in our downtown area, we have open spaces to build. And it's very possible that it may take several years to get interested parties to build down here in Federal Way. We're not Bellevue, obviously. So how long are you willing to allow the property to be empty before you try to find a, perhaps another affordable housing developer to just put up more affordable housing? You know, I think that's part of the, the process that we need to go through with the city and the community is to try to understand kind of what is the vision and then compare it to kind of what is the feasibility, like what are we seeing from the market? You know, I think depending on what we land on in terms of what the goals are, um, you know, I think in general, uh, we are seeing in a lot of station areas that all of a sudden the market starts to sense the opportunity and then it's just gangbusters. You know, everybody's buying land and speculating and, and investing. And so I think, you know, when I look at, at a site like Federal Way, there's a lot of investment that 
that you've already made in your 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 community, and we you know I think our our view is that um, once these streets go in, we're, you know we're a, actually a big difference between this pro the the Spring District project and and down or in the the Federal Way Transit Center is that we didn't build the site infrastructure for the Spring District development because of a variety of reasons, uh, mostly because it was so dependent on what the developer ultimately was going to build. And in, in here, we're building the blocks. We're building it in utilities. We're, do, you know, we're building the streets. And so I think that we're, we're taking away some of the risk uh, for developers. And so I think that uh, we are prepared um, to have that discussion about what does phasing look like, because that's ultimately something that, that you as a stakeholder are going to care about um, for some of the reasons that I think already got brought up about tax base and other questions, which is do you want to wait for, you know, if there isn't a lot of office buildings getting developed, you might, and that's something we need to confirm, right? Like how, what would it take for the market to build something like that? And, and a, kind of a sensitivity analysis around uh, is it worth waiting for five years to kind of see how things happen? And, and that, you know, if, it's, if you can move forward with on some buildings, maybe it's okay, right? Um, but if it's everything waiting, four blocks, six acres of land right at the heart, that might not be something that people want to do. And so I think it's, we don't have the answer on that yet, but I think we want to, that's part of the conversation we will have with, with the city. Considering that in our downtown we have the Commons Mall, which is going to be redeveloped, and then the city owns property just a few blocks away from the light rail, which is going to be developed. There's quite a bit of land that could be developed, and it's not all going to be developed at the same time. And the, my concern is that we do it right, including Sound Transit doing it right, and not putting five or six pad sites for affordable housing right in our downtown area, because that isn't doing it right. And if we have to wait, we have to wait. But you know, a downtown isn't built overnight. It takes planning, it takes uh, a lot of planning, it takes a vision, and it takes um, an overall plan as to how and what we're gonna have in our downtown. And I wouldn't want Sound Transit to be so eager to get these sites either sold or used that they, within four or five years, just put every site at surplus site as affordable housing. That is not what the city wants. It's not what the citizens want, and it's not what this council wants. So I, I just hope that we're not too eager to, um, to try to get something there, just to have something there. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Councilmember Sepha Dawson. Yeah, um, I think the concern, well, uh, uh, Kat, I'm responding or I'm um, commenting on your comment, uh, Deputy Mayor. I think when we're looking at affordable housing, I want to make sure that people are not thinking it's just low income. It's affordable to people who have the regular jobs like my job, and I'm looking at the, at the chart. And for a family of four, it goes up to $94,000 or so currently at the 80% AMI. So I would like to... Um, for us to not be so worried about the, the title of affordable housing because it seems to meet our needs. And what, it, yeah, so every time I hear pe you know, people's concern about affordable housing, I'm afraid that people mean it's for low income, like what I do at the Housing Authority. We do serve people who are within 30 and below or 50 and below AMI. And so when it says 80, it's people who don't even qualify for subsidized housing. So I just want to make sure that we are clear on how we um, frame that because it can't be exclusionary. And Sound Transit also is to serve people who need to get to and from work on light, light rail, so they need to have access to the transportation. And so um, I just want to bring that to your attention. That's all. Thank you, though. All right. Council President Coach Mark. And then Councilmember uh, Walsh. Okay, one last question. Um, just out of curiosity, is it one developer in the Spring District or multiple developers, and who are they? Yeah, so uh, Bridge Housing, which is a nonprofit affordable housing developer, is the, the, they were the responder to the RFP, and they're doing a lot of the site development work. 
Um, and then we have partners of Essex Property Trust, which is a market rate housing developer, and Touchstone, which is a URG company who's going to develop the uh, office buildings. So three, three developers there. Thank you. All right. Yes, Mark Walsh. Uh, a couple of questions. So the, the bridge housing one, that would not go back on, t on property tax rolls, then, correct? Well, it, it does go back on the property tax roll. They're just taxed at a different rate. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and, and then my, my uh, uh, original question here. Uh, with that being 80% of it needing to be, be less than or equal to 80 AMI, uh, is there anything that, so, so that's affordable housing. Is there anything that we can do to assure that it, to meet that, it doesn't go down to low-income housing? And because obviously low-income housing would also be less than 80 percent AMI as well. I think th through the process, you know, we really want to try to figure out what are the goals we're trying to achieve. And I, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I think that through this process, you know, we're going to look at what are the, the housing needs in a community, including, you know, what kind of needs, you know, part of that is informed through our engagement with the city and, you know, King County and others. And I think part of what we're, um, for affordable home ownership, most of the affordable housing that's being produced in the home ownership world is at about 80% of area median income because every unit requires a direct subsidy to construct. Um, and try, and it's just dollar for dollar is what, what has to be brought uh, to just, just to achieve 80%. Uh, when you're talking about producing affordable housing and rental, uh, the, the workhorse of that is, is low-income housing tax credits, which needs to achieve an average uh, area median income of 60% of AMI or below. And so I think what we've seen is, a, you know, we've done some research into is a building that's at 80% of the units at 80% AMI a viable product because no one's building it? Um, and that the answer was no at the time. And so the answer is that, you know, I think as we go to try to, uh, there's a question of what is the vision that we're trying to achieve and what who are we trying to make serve? We do have a policy at Sound Transit to expand housing options in station areas in, with a priority on affordable housing. And I think that, um, you know, the low-income housing tax credit is a, is a tool, uh, really is prioritizing, you know, below 60% AMI and that most, and again, it requires other subsidy to do that. Our land is not enough of a subsidy to, to build it. And as a result, you know, we are aligning typically our funding with the local jurisdiction who might bring resources to it, uh, King County and, and other local funders. So that way, you know, we're all rowing in the same direction as opposed to sound transit making decisions that then creates an unfounded mandate on somebody else. And so I think. So, so very easily it could devolve from affordable housing into low income housing. Well, I think, I think that, you know, we need to work through the process to understand what are the housing needs and what are the goals. But I think in general, you would, if you look across our portfolio, you know, about half of the, a little over half the units are at 50% and 60% AMI, and that usually, and they're almost all 4% uh, low-income housing tax credit projects, so they do include 30% of area median income units. Um, and sometimes, in some locations, there's been other types of housing that's been a priority for a local jurisdiction. Um, but for the most part, you know, even Senior City, which predates the, uh, uh, our statute, is a 50% and 60% AMI project, and there's a long wait list to get in. And so I think that there certainly is a, a big interest um, among some of our stakeholders and certainly within the, the populations of people who want to live in the community that are at, are at deeper AMIs that would be considered low-income housing. Thank you. All right, Council, any other questions? Anything else to add? I guess just that uh, you know we'll we'll continue to be available. You know, be looking forward to working with your city staff. So thank you again for the opportunity. Well, we very much appreciate. It. I know, and for the staff that did show up here, thank you so much for uh, for braving the uh, uh, the South County traffic. Thank you very much for a very detailed and professional presentation. Appreciate it. And uh, I'll actually, I one of the things I want to say is uh, uh, Peter Rogoff has been a, a good partner, and uh, I meet with him monthly. In fact, actually, I think it's either this week or next. I've got I think. I can't remember. I think it may be next week. I've got another meeting with him, and he's been uh, very accessible. Um, and as of as of uh, 
the Sound Transit staff. So we appreciate your partnership and your uh, transparency. Uh, Council? Um, I, actually, I just want to say thank you to Brian Medlin for helping me before the meeting. <laughs> 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 and Ryan, thank you very much for your work as, as well. Uh, he's, uh, Ryan, if, for, for folks watching, he is our uh, liaison to Sound Transit. Um, all right, uh, thank you. Uh, a great presentation, you guys. Thank you. All right, Council, uh, we have an executive session, and uh, <clears throat> it's uh, regarding uh, potential sale or lease of property pursuant to RCW 4230-1101C. Um, will be an executive session um, uh, approximately 30 minutes. All right, uh, we are adjourned for that purpose. Thank you.